Hi, this is Esther with Discover Your Origins. In this video, I'm going to take a good look at the 1820 U.S. Census. The 1820 U.S. Census was the fourth census taken since the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, and it's very similar to the previous censuses that were taken. So let's go to the National Archives page and take a closer look. The official census day was August 7, 1820, and it was finished in about six months. Uh, the census was taken by the U.S. Marshals with their assistance again, and they had to use whatever paper they could find. There weren't pre-printed forms. Um, the tally was uh, counted and forwarded to the Secretary of State, who was John Quincy Adams. So the questions were expanded for this census, and the age groupings were a little bit smaller than the previous census. So you had the free white males and then their age groupings, free white females and their groupings, number of foreigners not naturalized, and then you had age groupings for slaves and free uh, colored persons. And so there was definitely more columns on this census. And you can see an example here of the number of columns. The actual census pages don't look like this because almost none of the marshals would have had pre-printed forms like this. So they had to create the columns and then the names of the columns were not included in the form. So you definitely need to use these questions here as you're trying to figure out the numbers that you see on the census. Um, most of the states were included. Um, and again, you have to consider that some areas of the country were not yet states and they were included with other states. So for example, West Virginia was part of Virginia. There were some enumeration sheets that were lost. There's quite a few actually. Um, Arkansas Territory, Georgia had some counties missing, Missouri Territory and so on. New, New Hampshire, there's quite a few missing and a lot of Tennessee was also missing again. So, you know, at one time they existed and the, the counts were taken and forwarded but um, you know, over time, those enumeration sheets were lost. Uh, eventually, the uh, sheets were forwarded from the district courts to DC to be bound into books. And since then, of course, they've been digitized and available on all the major genealogy sites. So let's look at an example again of how to use a census like this to analyze your family. And on my blog, I'm looking at Lori Brockway. So, um, and I have an example here. I'll look at it a little closer of his um, census sheet. So um, let's actually go to Lori Brockway's family search page and learn a little bit more about him. So he was born October 1773 in Burlington, Hartford, Connecticut, and he died 27th of August 1851 in New Britain, Hartford, Connecticut. His wife was Susanna Marks. And they had four girls and three boys. Lori Brockway is the son of Samuel Brockway, who I, we talked about previously. So um, let's go look at the actual census page for Lori Brockway for 1820. And here it is. So you can see Lori Brockway, he's here underneath Truman Smith and above John Hart. And there are a number of columns which have numbers in them. You can see that there are double lines uh, between some of the columns, and that's just a separation of the groups. So this most left group here is the white males, and then you have the females. Um, and then so on with the uh, slaves and free people of color. You'll notice that there is a stamped number that's kind of upside down here, 561. Those were added later. Um, at the bottom of the sheet, there's numbers. So those are the counts of the columns, I'm assuming. Um, and then over here is written Burlington. You can see that there is some paper damage. And so it's possible there's a column here that's missing. Um, so it's hard to um, show you how those numbers break down um, easily from just the uh, census sheet here. So let's go back to my blog where I've broken it down. So we have two white males, 10 to 16 years old, 
one white male 16 to 26 years, one white male 45 years old and older, a white female under 10, we have three, white female 16 to 26, one, white female 26 to 45, one, and a white female 45 years and older, and one male slave under 14 years old. So when you're looking at these numbers, you want to look at the um, group uh, that you have on, say, Family Search or Ancestry, and see if you can assign people to each of these age groups. So that's what I did here below. Um, so we've got the two white male children, Perez and Marcus. Uh, the one male that's 16 to 26 is Denison. And then the 45-year-old and older is Lori. The three females are Mary Goodyear, Le Levia, and Phoebe Susan. The white female that's 16 to 26 is Urania. And then the white female, uh, 26 to 45, is Susanna. And we don't know who the white female that's over 45 years old. And then the male slave under 14 years old, and we don't know that person's name either. But from what I can tell, all of the children uh, for Lori and Susanna were accounted for. So there should be seven children. So we have two, three, six, and seven. So yeah, all of the children were at home in 1820. Probably for not very much longer, I would bet that Urania probably uh, marries and leaves pretty soon after the census. Um, so two mysteries in this particular household, you know, who is the white female that's 45 years and older? Um, from what I can tell, looking at the um, census for extended family, you know, this could be a mother or mother-in-law, but it doesn't appear to be that way. Um, so it could be somebody else. Also, the um, unknown enslaved person. Um, it is possible to potentially identify who this is. Um, this is the first Brockway family that I've seen that had a slave in the household. So it's possible that there are court records or newspaper articles that may have named this particular person. And it would be nice to be able to give this person a name. So it would be worth looking to see if it's possible. And one thing about Connecticut is a lot of people assume that Connecticut was an abolition state, and it was, but not in the way that you think. Um, they did pass a law for gradual abolition in 1784. So by 1820, you would think that there would be a lot of free um, people of color, and there wasn't. So um, there were still slaves in 1820 in Connecticut. Um, despite uh, what laws have been passed. Um, the gradual abolition meant that people were freed after so many years or um, based on their birth year. So um, it's something to definitely pay attention to. And there are some Roots Tech videos that go into this in greater detail. They're really interesting that I would recommend. So anyway, um, let's go back and look at the census page one more time to see what else we could learn. So one thing about the census from this time period is most often the head of household is a man that is named. But if you look a little bit closer, there are a few women on this page. So we have a Rhoda, an Abigail, and an Elizabeth. So that's interesting. And, you know, they may have been widows or, or whatnot, because it looks like there are some children in each of those households. So that, that's interesting. Um, there are no other Brockways listed on this page. So, um, you know, Lori is off on his own, it looks like. Um, so anyway, we learned a little bit more about the Brockway family again in this um, analysis. And so definitely some work that could be done um, learning more about Lori and his family. So I hope that is helpful. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.